You're listening to the Loving Your Own Soul podcast, and I'm your host, Britt Olson. Guided by my own intuition, my intention is to deliver genuine conversations centered around health and wellness, spirituality, self-expression, and culture. In this space, I will provide you with real-life stories, theories, and inspiring perspectives to help you uncover and tap into your own true potential. I'm so grateful you've chosen to tune in with me on this mindful exploration to living a more fluid life through a deeper connection to the soul. Now let's dive into today's journey. Hello and welcome to the Loving Your Own Soul podcast. I'm your host, Britt Olson, and I am so grateful to have you tuning in here with us today. This episode is just such a wonderful episode. We've got Liz McKean, who is down in the Tampa area with me. She's originally from New York, and she is an avid yoga teacher, as she will explain in her story how yoga actually saved her life as we walk through her recovery journey and just bravery in sharing her experience of all the different different things that life has for us, that life throws at us, that there are certain experiences that our souls are meant to experience in this lifetime, and sometimes they are different than others. But we really chat through the power of relationships and Liz's authenticity and just willingness and open heart to share her story simply for the benefit of being able to reach those ears who need to hear her story as at one point in time she really relied on and needed to hear these similar recovery stories and that's what really propelled her to the place that she's currently sitting in her life. So she is just so admirable, such a beautiful soul. It's so funny. I feel like with every guest I almost develop this like mama bear love and support for and in re-editing the episodes just get emotional of just so so proud of all of the beautiful hearts and souls who have come into this space to share their stories knowing that they will impact the listeners and the ears who need to hear their stories will hear them at the right point in time through their life so i'm just so grateful myself to be able to share space with these souls host a platform where they can feel comfortable in doing so and yeah just watch their continued evolution in their journeys. It is truly such a special gift, and I'm so grateful that you all are here to also take part in this journey and listen to all of these wonderful stories. So I will not, you know, really take too much time. I really want to jump into Liz's journey and her story because I just have no doubt that you are going to love it. Um, But before we do so, just a couple quick things to run by some of you. As some of you may know, I have recently officially launched my holistic wellness company, Ambu, where I provide one-on-one holistic health coaching services. I also have a nine-week program, Life in Balance, where the next round of that will be starting up in January 2021. So if you are interested in that, you can follow the link in my bio. We also are hosting Modern Wellness Community Mornings, which are the last Friday of the month, and we have two more left for this year one on this coming Friday, October 30th, and then we have another one the in lieu of Thanksgiving. We're actually doing it the week beforehand on Thursday, November 20th, and that will be the last one for the year. Again, there are um, links in the show notes where you can find all of that information if you are interested in joining us there or if you are interested in any of my free consultations with my holistic health coaching business, definitely hit me up. I would love to chat with you, make some connections, and just see if there is any way that I can currently support you in your own journeys. But also speaking of journeys, for those who know me know that I absolutely love turquoise jewelry. And with that, I love just dainty necklaces and rings and bracelets. I always have some array of bracelets on and usually a necklace as well. Just kind of smaller jewelry is something that I absolutely love. And There is a woman who just launched her jewelry company who actually makes turquoise jewelry pieces that are small and dainty and are in that good size. I've been honestly looking for pieces like this for so long. It's um, her name. Her company is Wildcat Creations on Instagram. 
I will link her in the show notes as well, but she just launched her new jewelry company this last weekend and her pieces are Honestly, I wish I knew about her years ago or even last year for my wedding because they were exactly what I was looking for and couldn't find at the time. But she's got even like white buffalo and all different shades of turquoise, beautiful sterling silver, and just so many amazing products. So just wanted to give her a shout out. This is not a sponsored ad or anything, just simply love for a new creator in the space and small business owner, female owner as well, which is really exciting. So Wildcat Creations, definitely go check her out on Instagram. I highly recommend it. But I think that is pretty much it. We are coming to a close on the month of October in 2020. Crazy to think that the year is almost over and we have a Halloween blue moon, which is a super rare event coming up. And yeah, just, you know, things are good. So keep on, keep it on. Thank you all so much for being here and let's go head into today's episode. Well, Liz, thank you so much for jumping on here. I am so excited to hold this space with you, chat with you, even get to know you a little bit better than I already do, but you're joining me from the Tampa area, so Mm -hmm. another Florida friend, which I love, but thank you just so much for being open to sharing your story today. Gosh, my pleasure. It's an honor. Like It's it's a a gift to be here, so I just can't thank you enough for the opportunity. Thank you. And I love, we connected online and then have done a couple virtual things. You're a current yoga teacher and instructor, and I see you doing Mm -hmm. so many fun things just throughout Tampa. And I know kind of we've survived COVID and are still on that road and everything. Continue to survive. Yep. (laughs) Absolutely. But what exactly do you, I feel like you're involved in a whole bunch of different yogi things in the Tampa Bay community. Yeah, and I'll I'll do my best, but it, it sounds kind of chaotic, but it's like organized chaos. But it's it is it's a lot of yoga. I do my kind of like typical um, yoga job is that I do teach uh, one night a week at a studio, JID's in uh, Seminole Heights, a little outside neighborhood of Tampa, and I have a community class that I teach every weekend for uh, Kava Kava Bar Kava and Kratom Bar down in Tampa, and that's a free for anybody who wants to come kind of class. Um, I also help to run a program, a yoga program with a martial arts gym. It's like the only, Tampa's only martial arts and yoga studio. Oh, yeah. And uh, with my partner, we're just kind of spearheading that and running that program. So I spend a lot of time teaching there. And I also teach uh, on a kind of a substitute at um, a actual inpatient rehab center in Tampa. And I go and teach meditation and yoga there. I have an online platform, a Facebook group where I do some teaching. I also have some private clients that I work with. And then I also work with the Phoenix, which is an organization that's actually nationwide, practically worldwide at this point. And that is a nonprofit that provides free activities for people in recovery and their supporters. So I'm, I'm about to get more involved with them. And I think that's all the places I teach right now. So it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love how you're just sharing and spreading the gift of yoga in so many different outlets as well. I mean, yoga has kind of taken over, which is a beautiful thing. It's such a gorgeous practice. It hits, it just works on so many different levels, but I love that you're, you know, not in the standard yoga studio, so to say, and are incorporating yoga in just so many different outlets that you wouldn't really think of. Totally. Yeah. Well, sharing yoga is just the honor of my life. Yoga saved my life in a lot of ways, but um, I decided to become a yoga teacher really so that I so that I could share that. And my purpose has always been, my why has always been to share yoga with folks who, who need it the most. And as wonderful as the studio environment is, and I, you know, I go to the yoga studio and I love it and I teach there a little bit, I think that there's so many people that can't access that for one reason or another. And often those are the people that need it so desperately. And I am so, like I said, it's such an honor to be able to share it with people. I love that. And you said that yoga saved your life at one point in time. Do you want to go ahead and kind of dive in and we'll give the listeners just a little bit of a backstory as to yourself and kind of what brought you into the journey of yoga? Yeah. Well, I got into yoga. This is actually super embarrassing. And I'm not sure if I've ever shared this before, but I wanted to lose weight. And I also was a big fan of 
sister. Do you remember Tia and Tamira on Sister like a million years ago? You might even be too young. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So they had a, a show on, I don't know, E or Bravo or something like that. And Tia had just given birth and she was losing weight and she had lost weight because of yoga. And so she came out with a yoga video and I was like, well, I'm going you know, to lose weight and I'm going to do yoga like Tia. And I got her video. I think it was like, might even been like a VHS, I don't know, or DVD or something. Yeah. And that was how I started yoga and realized that I really enjoyed it. And then I signed myself up for a gym and started doing it there. And yeah, it, it progressed from there. But That's amazing. I haven't thought of Tia and Tamara in so long, but completely remember them. I love that. What a fun yeah. throwback. <laughs> I know, I know. I kind of almost forgot that until you said, I'm like, yeah, that was, that was, I think I had dabbled. I had like taken classes here and there, like in college, you know, I took a couple classes and I think I'd gone with my mom or something, but that was when I was like, okay, I'm going to do this yoga thing because yeah. she had done it. So it must be cool. <laughs> so I started there and I also, um, I always wanted to get into yoga because I've had lifelong struggled with really debilitating anxiety and panic disorder. So forever, it was a struggle that I had. And you just hear that yoga is something that really can help with that. And I kind of thought that I was a person who couldn't do yoga because I had such difficulty mm. with anxiety. Because, you know, to tell me to quiet my mind and to take deep breaths, honestly, one of the worst things you can tell a person in the middle of a panic attack is to like, calm down and take deep breaths and sit still. It's <laughs> too late. You know, the ship has sailed. So, like so far past that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I kind of felt like I was that way in general, just too far past it. So when I started doing it for a completely different reason, it's kind of like, like sneaking vegetables in a smoothie, you know, it was just like, I was doing it for the exercise, but all the good stuff started seeping in, you know, like mm -hmm. the mindfulness and things like that and started to realize that it was helping. Unfortunately, the other thing that I was doing to help that anxiety and panic disorder was drinking a lot. And that ended up being the solution. That was my solution to my anxiety that ended up being its own problem. So I really struggled with um, alcohol, with substance abuse in that, in that way. And so yoga was something I would kind of go in and out of based on where I was within that, that challenge that I was facing. Mm -hmm. And more and more started to realize that if I... Well, first of all, that drinking doesn't actually help anxiety. It does in the moment, but then it makes it a whole lot worse. And then it becomes its own, its own set of problems. But I realized that when I, when I felt good, I, I could do yoga and I felt I liked myself for the first time, you know, within the four corners of that mat, I was able to hear my own thoughts and be in touch with my own heart. And I realized that there was some good stuff there. And then when I would struggle and, and, and drink too much, I couldn't, I couldn't show up for myself. I, I would lose that. So yoga for me was like the reward of sobriety. And because it helped me to, it gave me a reason to show up for myself over and over again. It, again, the vegetables and the smoothie, you know, permeated my life more and more. And for some reason that was the, that was my lifeline out. That was my recovery it was just coming back to yoga and showing back up and, and knowing that the mat was always there. And eventually that was, that's, that's honestly how I get so, how I got sober is, is what I, what I consider mm. my, my lifeline. And I, and I would have, I, I couldn't have lived much longer otherwise. Like you don't survive. Addiction is one of those things that you either end up in, in jail or dead, you know? So, mm -hmm. so yoga saved so my life for sure. <laughs> that's beautiful. In that process, was it kind of like a rocky road between drinking and choosing the yoga mat like were there days or times where you would just completely avoid yoga altogether oh, yeah. because you didn't want to kind of go back into that space or like face what would happen on that mat yeah for sure because I mean yoga is beautiful and wonderful but it's not as fast you know if you're like really feeling panicky and anxious like a drink is going to make that feeling go away really quickly it's going to be a whole lot worse on the other side but it's a fast fix uh, I think for a lot of people in my situation, certainly drinking was drinking was a solution. You know, I was looking for a solution to a problem and that was just a really fast solution. Yoga was also a solution, but it's a long game, you know, like it's mm -hmm. beautiful when you're on that mat, but it's really that daily practice that gets you to the point that you're really healthy uh, mentally and physically. So it did, it took a lot of, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of stops and starts before I really chose yoga and in that chose myself, you know, and decided mm -hmm. it was worth it. And there was going to be a light at the end of this tunnel. So yeah, it was Rocky is, is incredibly, an incredibly kind way to say, say how, <laughs> how that path was. Yeah. Oh, what a commitment as well, just to make to yourself, to the mat, to your soul, everything like that. I know with a lot of different times in life and as things pertain 
to addiction and just moving forward and kind of that evolution at times there can also be either like a particular situation or rock bottom that kind of takes place to really pivot and shift us Mm -hmm. in your journey to recovery. Did you have any rock bottom or any particular situation that kind of shifted you? Honestly, so many that I, I can't even count. Like I, I would find a rock bottom and then I would find a shovel and I would dig deeper and find a deeper bottom. So the, the things that I did and experiences that I had, I mean, I, it was like a different person, you know, like I, I don't even recognize that person truly. So there are a lot of things that one would say if they heard, you know, each scenario, like, well, of course that was it. Of course that's, you know, then you knew you had to stop, but yeah. that's the amazing thing about, about that addiction is that it's a love story, you know, it's an abusive relationship, you know, and it's the, you know, the woman that you hear about who is with this partner who's, you know, hurting them and they just keep going back and you're like, why do you keep going back? And it's, it's because, you know, you love it and it's a quick fix and it's really hard, especially when, like I said, it's a solution. It's, it's, there's something underlying that's so, so painful that you're trying to Mm -hmm. escape. So in the moment, like the pain of continuing this, this, horrible, the drinking, you know, continuing that. Yeah. In the long run, that's going to suck. But in this moment right now, the panic attack, the anxiety, the just the fear that I'm waking up with every day is much worse. And to numb that, to escape that is, it feels like an emergency. It feels like survival, you know? So it's hard to understand if you haven't lived it, but it really is. It just, it takes something deep, deep in yourself to know that you're worth this life to finally choose the harder path, which is, okay, there is a solution here. There is a light at the end of this tunnel, but it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. And I'm not going to be able to, you know, take that easy, that easy fix and that, that easy button. And the moment is going to be really hard. And to convince yourself that you're going to survive it, it takes a lot. And I was really lucky because I have, I mean, really lucky is saying so mind, mildly, like I have family and my husband who just stuck with me and just believed even when I didn't believe that, you know, this was going to, that I was, that I was worth it. And then I was going to get through this. And then the only time that I really believed them, that I really felt that way too, is when I was on the yoga mat and I was taking those deep breaths and I was getting in those postures. And I just finally hurt, like I said, heard myself, you know, like felt my heart. And those were the moments that I knew that it was that it was going to be okay, that I was, you know, I was in there still, you know, all was not lost. And it just took that happening. It just took that happening over and over again and realizing over and over again that that, that those people were going to show up, that that mat was still going to be there, that, you know, I could do it. When it finally stuck, honestly, it was, it was, it was a terrible situation. It was, um, you know, uh, I had actually been sober for longer than not for, for years. Mm. And I had a scenario that I know other people have experienced similar where I was just so afraid and the panic attacks were just coming so rapid. And so it was just like, you have that, that, that bucket moment. And mm-hmm. it's just like, you know, this is the only solution and there's nothing else but this moment and I can't survive. And so I, I drank a lot and then I wanted to hurt myself and luckily told somebody that. And so then there was a whole, you know, all the things that happen when you, when you tell somebody that there's hospital, there's facilities, there's things like that. And it was honestly, probably not even the worst of the things that, that had happened and that I felt that I had done, but for whatever reason, it was the last one. That was the last time. And, you know, I guess go out with a bang if you're going to go out at all. But, um, (laughs) but for whatever reason that was it, I think, I think one, now that I'm kind of talking it through, I think one of the reasons that was it is because in the past, It was, if I had gone back, if I had been, you know, sober for a long time and then I went back to drinking, it would take some time because I always tried to convince myself that I could, you know, drink like a, like a normal person. And it would take some time before I would, you know, suddenly be like, oh, now it's happening every day. Oh, now it's happening all day, every day, you know, and Mm -hmm. this time was by far the fastest. It was like, you know, 24 hours. So it just, there was no, there was no fun on the way down that hill into that hole, you know? So that was certainly one of the things that, that made me know, but like really know that this is, that this is it, that this just can't ever happen again, that I won't survive this. Yeah. That final shakeup. What was that like then actually walking through that recovery and really kind of walking through those tough moments of not having that bandaid to cover up the pain inside and even kind of coming to terms 
you know, with the pain, I don't know if you've read Untamed, but Glennon Doyle just oh. talking about, yeah, amazing how she talks about just feeling it all and feeling yeah. all the things, which is so scary because that's what you were trying to cover up. Yeah. Um, but once you made that commitment to really walk through it, what did that look like? Because I know that wasn't easy at all. Yeah, it wasn't because it's hard to be human. You know, it's hard to feel things. And especially... Oh, yeah. We try you know, to avoid it all day long. <laughs> we sure do. Yeah, it's like, what what not can I numb? You know, the phone, the TV, the food, the, the booze, whatever. Um, we all have our are things that we try to do to avoid the feelings. And I, I still have those things, but let me just tell you, like the day that I eat a whole entire bag of Sour Patch Kids, I'm still like, you know, this is okay. Oh my gosh, <laughs> binging out on Sour Patch Kids that I think so right. many people can relate to. <laughs> I know, I don't know what it is. It's, oh yeah. man. Yeah, so, but I'll take it, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm not going to feel great afterwards, but there are worse, there are worse vices, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, so, so there are days that that's, that that's the case that I've got a, a, you know, an easy button, but it's something that's, that's not going to kill me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so there's that, but then also it's just that daily, honestly, it's like the daily yoga practice, the daily meditation, the daily affirmations, just the daily work to remind myself that it's, that, that life is wonderful, that a bad, it can be a bad day and not a bad life. And honestly, it's, I'm actually really grateful for everything that happened and everything I went through because I wake up every morning with just overwhelming, like visceral gratitude. And I, I don't think I would have that if I hadn't been so, so far on the other side, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that it is amazing what you can overcome with that, you know, to have, like I, like I, like, like Glennon Doyle says, like I can do hard things, but I can't do easy things. You know, I'm great in a crisis, but give me a little inconvenience. Those are the things that will send me off the edge. Those are the things that I'll spiral over. But in those moments, I, I'm able to access, and I think it's because of the practice. And I think it's because of all the ups and downs and all the terrible things that happened is that I, I'm able to access that gratitude and remember, you know, remember the bad, so just not enough to get like sucked into it, but enough to just, just realize how beautiful the moment is and realize how lucky I am to be here how you know just wonderful it is to be alive and to be healthy and to wake up proud of myself you know wake up like being the person that I that I meant to be with work to do and with all sorts of issues and with an empty bag of Sour Patch Kids beside beside me but you know but still <laughs> like yeah but it, it really is it really is that gratitude That's yeah like, it's just amazing it's so important it's interesting too just being able to then look back on it and seeing how that pendulum has swung just so far on the other side to now mm -hmm. be on that other side and just to kind of look back at it in hindsight and yeah it really just completely opens up the heart with over yeah yeah those lows they're for a reason you know like the low lows they they're worth it for the for the high highs and I don't mean that and I know there's you know certainly mental health things there where you know that could be argued but in my experience and in you know in my in my life just like I said, waking up in the morning and, you know, being able to, to face my people and, you know, being a person that I can be proud to be is, that is the highest of the highs. <laughs> Absolutely. That's yeah. so beautiful. And yeah. I love how yoga is just such a key factor in that and kind of that stability among many things like your husband and everything, but just, I love that piece of it as well. At some point you obviously obtained your yoga teacher training. Mm -hmm. Was that training kind of part of your recovery process or something that just took place along the way? I mean, everything's really part of the recovery process. I mean, I think for all of us, every single day, we're just recovering from yes. something. Um, but that was, it was something I wanted so that I could share this gift, mm -hmm. you know, and I wanted to be able to share yoga with people who, who needed it, that didn't necessarily have that, that access, like I said. Yeah. Um, and people who don't know they need it, you know? So um, I'm so fortunate to be able to teach for a couple organizations that um, that exist to help people who are in recovery, and like I teach at a at a rehab, an inpatient rehab, as a as a sub, I fill in when they when they need me, and you know those are people that are just in it, you know, like still in it, and you know I'll teach to a room of people, and only a handful of them a handful of them are actually practicing, you know, and a lot of them have just never ever done yoga before and they don't think they can you know and to be able to to reach them even just to get them to take the deep breaths you know and just to 
take that journey inward, whether or not they're doing the actual physical, physical practice is amazing. And, I, and it's not something that necessarily, not a tool they necessarily might have reached for otherwise, if it wasn't something that was being given to them in that moment. And that's where the miracles happen when it's, yeah. it's like a, this surprise gift, you know, this, this tool, this, this thing that's inside of them, you know, like, cause that yoga, that all that stuff that comes from yoga, that's not external. Like I'm teaching, but I'm not giving you anything, you know, like I'm just helping you find it in you. And I mean, there's nothing better than that, you know? So true. It is amazing what I love. You said it earlier with what happens on the four corners of that map, but Mm -hmm. it is truly so incredible. And it's such just an awakening of what truly does lie inside of us and the power and stability and everything that we have. I know in moments of my life, not really understanding what was going on inside, but sometimes I would walk into a yoga class and would just erupt into tears and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not understand why but it was like okay I don't know everyone else is a stranger I'm just gonna kind of silently let this flow because this feels I needed this right now yeah Um, so there's just so much that comes out of it I know it's so true yeah I I'd say I cry more often than not when I do my own practice um and you know not like occasionally but not usually gut-wrenching tears but for sure and, and often it's just gratitude, but just as often, I don't know what it is. And it's, but it's something, it's something that's just being released, that's coming from inside and it's a uh, cleansing every single time. So cleansing. A friend was telling me recently that when your chakras are pretty balanced or even just opening up with a lot of love and gratitude, that that can also, when you have those tears that just kind of come through, can be a sign as well of oh, yeah. and awakenings. And yeah, it's so beautiful. Totally. Yeah. A lot of wisdom that lives inside of your body. It knows what it, what it needs. And that's, that's another gift of yoga is that connection, that mind, body, soul connection, you know, and, and hearing what your body needs. And I think that's sometimes where the tears come from too, is, is that it's like the relief, the physical relief happening when your body's like being listened, listened to, you know, and your, your body knows it can trust you to give it what it needs because it's a relationship your mind and body have. And Absolutely. That wisdom, mindfulness is one thing that yoga kind of teaches us in your recovery journey and just kind of your day to day. How did mindfulness kind of step in and kind of maybe give you some tools and resources when you were off the mat? Because obviously can't be on the mat 24 seven. Uh, But not 24 (laughs) seven. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a moment to moment practice and I, you know, fail as much as I succeed at it for sure, you know, um, but it always comes back for me to that, to the gratitude, you know, to any time the moment seems to be getting away from me, if I can feel anxiety rising or any other emotion that feels like it's taking over, you know, I'm letting that, that emotion drive the ship. Great to feel an emotion, but when you're only reacting from, from that space, that's when it's a, a cue to, to go inward and to take those deep breaths and, um, again, just to remember how beautiful this life is, how beautiful this moment is, even when it's, you know, in traffic and, you know, the guy next to me is a big jerk or whatever, just to find that inside space that is, it's like your drishti. So when you're doing a balance pose in, or really any pose, but particularly balance poses, a uh, teacher will cue you to find, find a drishti, a non-moving point where your eyes can rest so that when you're doing that tree pose or whatever you're doing, there's something not moving so that it's easier to not lose your balance. Um, and eventually that, that's internal. You, know, you have that, that non-moving point internally. So with all the world going crazy around you and all the emotions happening and to be able to bring it back, like zoom into that drishti, that internal point, that mm-hmm. point of focus, that non-moving point, that part of you that you can trust that's just going to be there and that is stable and is still and that that's practice, you know, finding that, being able to tune into that amidst the chaos, amidst the noise. So important. And there's so much chaos out there, especially, I mean, just even what we've all, everyone's on their individual path. However, as a collective, we've experienced a lot of chaos in 2020 that a lot of us are not, uh, you can't be prepared for chaos, so to say, but I like to believe that you can put the right tools and steps in place. So when it does come, you're not completely flailing all over the place. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the yoga. That's that's the mat is practice for that, you know, because the the mat is a safe space where you are just 
just trying to take all that stuff and zoom in in that nice little, you know, quiet room with candles lit or wherever you happen to be. So you're just practicing. That's why it's called a practice. You're practicing, practicing, practicing. And then when you're out there in the world without your mat, without your, you know, fancy pants on and everything, and the things are just going crazy and you're stuck in the rain, you don't have your umbrella to be able to come to come back to that because you've practiced, because you've trained your body and your mind to go inward. It's like a magic trick to do. <laughs> it is pure magic. Yeah. Really the mind is such a hard one too. It is. I know. Yeah. Really really is. On that. You mentioned your husband was a huge piece of your journey and I love that relationships are so, so big during your whole journey. Where particular was your relationship, whether it was with your husband or any other relationships kind of impacted and was it something that he was aware of, you know, like there's always that other, um, piece in the, in dealing with addiction and everything like that, where yeah. the other partner, the other partner is also suddenly going through their own journey. And at times can even be in a bit of the addictive process as well, you know, kind mm-hmm. of that, the drama of it and the ups and downs and things like that. Um, just how was that for you guys? Yeah. Well, I, I can certainly say that everyone if, if you love a person who has, who is going through addiction, who's experiencing that, you're going to be affected. And I, and I don't, I, I feel like everyone is in some way affected, you know, there's always that ripple effect, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't speak to that experience for them, you know, for my husband, I can't, I mean, I can't tell you what his experience is like, but, and, and in my family, you know, I have amazing parents. I have, you know, my brother and sister, and then I have these friends that are just like, I don't, it's, it's the kind of love that you don't have to earn, you know, because nobody, you know, we don't deserve it, but we don't have to, you know, it's just, mm-hmm. just that, those, that like real, real unconditional love. Mm-hmm. And, um, we're so lucky to have those too. Oh my gosh. So just, lucky. yeah. So, so lucky. It's just the reason that we're here to, to have those relationships. So for, for me, um, my husband anyway, being the closest person, you know, lived with me, um, there was certainly a lot of drama and the thing that he, did is that he just still always even you know he didn't know what to do he doesn't have any history with mental health issues even so in the beginning when we first got to know each other even just dealing with the fact that I had this chronic anxiety and panic disorder like he didn't understand that you know and he wanted to say the things like calm down there's nothing to worry about which is hilarious to say to a person who's you know having a panic attack because I mean if only it was that easy trust me I know I would I would love to exactly but he he learned you know like he he was he always knew I was in there. Like he just loved me and loved the person that was inside. Even when I was, you know, cliche enough to say like a shell of a person, you know, even when there were days that I couldn't get out of bed because it was just so, I was just so sick. It just, it was just so debilitating, whether it was with the alcohol or the just panic disorder. And even when he got it totally wrong, even when he said totally the wrong thing and, you know, made me worse, which is not actually possible, but in the moment, you know, would send me off the rail, he still would just keep showing up. And that was the amazing thing, just that he just kept showing up and he kept showing me that life was worth it. You know, like even when things were falling apart, um, and it's hard to have a partner who's falling to pieces and to be able to just like go on and continue to live your life, but he had to, you know, and he'd get up and he'd go to work every day and he'd, you know, treat himself to ice cream and, you know, do talk to the people he loved and like do the joyful things, do the life things. And which was just so unbelievable for me to see. You know, I remember watching, um, even my mom, I have this really, really intense memory of my mom in the morning one time when she was staying with me just because I was struggling so much, um, making a piece of toast and putting peanut butter on it. And I just remember thinking, what does that feel like? Like, I don't even remember. I don't know if I've ever known what that feels like to just be able to like put peanut butter on a piece of toast, like everything's okay. Like you're just going to eat that and like do the day. You know, that was so unfathomable, unfathomable to me. But they did, like the people who love me, they just did. They they not only showed up for me and just would tell me over and over again that they loved me and that I was strong and I was gonna get through this, but they just showed me what it looked like to live. They never got in the bed with me and just gave up. You know, they just kept doing life. And to see people do that, just keep spreading that peanut butter was like a miracle to me to watch them do that. And I I, I wanted that so bad, you know, and I actually think about that now when I do things like that, when I make myself toast in the morning, I think that's why I eat peanut butter toast every morning now, because I think it's just like some kind of ritual, just showing myself, proving to myself that like I did it, you know, I got here, 
but you know, doing the dishes or like going to the grocery store to be able to do that and just, and just do it and just not have this battle, this warfare happening in my head and be so terrified have my chest be so tight. And I have my moments where my chest is tight, but I can still do it. I can still do my day. And, and that is so much because the people who loved me didn't lay down and die next to me. You know, they just kept, kept doing life and kept showing up. Yeah. I love that. It's oh, such a beautiful, um, just very symbolic as well, especially with where we sit with our modern day culture, yoga and mindfulness and just the health and wellness industry is booming and booming. However, there's certain aspects of it that I think have become maybe a little bit misconstrued or misused as it pertains to self-care or just the term a ritual. Like a ritual doesn't have to be this hour long drawn out ceremony that you give to yourself every morning before you start the day. And if you do that, do do that. That's amazing. If you have right. for it, however, a ritual can be as simple as spreading the peanut butter on that toast and being so grateful in that moment or that ritual of putting the dishes away. Like a ritual has so much free form to be so many things. I feel like we've just gotten a little lost into mm-hmm. the meaning of certain things, but that right there, like that was so pivotal and meaningful for you. And you yeah. continue to refer back to that, which is amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. We get really into, I, I do a little bit of coaching now and I really like to start with morning routines and not because I think you need to, you know, have your celery juice and then your lemon water and then your smoothie. And then, oh my God, that's a lot of beverages, like all the things and then light a candle and then meditate and then yoga and then go for a walk. And it's like, okay, it's time for bed. And then you're looking what? at that list. Like, okay, did I do my morning routine? Correctly? I know. And if you forget something, you have failed. And then what? You failed the morning. So what are you going to do? I mean, I guess go back to bed, you know? So I like to start with that because I think it's so important to set yourself up for success. Like any of those kind of rituals or plans or I'm a huge list person. I like mm-hmm. systems. I like, um, you know, it's, it, like I said, like my, even my yoga schedule it looks like chaos, but I have lists of lists and it makes me feel very safe. And I like to have things on lists that I know that I'm going to do that are going to make me feel happy that I, under no circumstances, will I not do this because it's easy, but then I get to check it off. And that's just one more success and got to celebrate each success. So if all your morning ritual is, is getting up and drinking a glass of water and go into the bathroom. I mean, you're going to do that anyway, but like put that on a list and check that off and you did it. Yeah, you did it. What a great start to the day. You You woke up and you did that. You've already are already more accomplished than we give ourselves credit for. For sure. They were, there were plenty of days that I could not do those little things. So I mean, that is reason to celebrate. Absolutely. (laughs) Another thing you mentioned was how your husband was able to find joy, his own joy Mm -hmm. in the moments of everything, like going out for ice cream, if that's what he needed or whatever that is. And I love that piece of it as well, because oftentimes when we are going through struggle or in doom and gloom or whatever it is, we so always lose sight or almost even feel guilty of trying to bring joy into those moments. But it mm-hmm. is so crucial for just our overall well being and making it out of those times alive as well. Absolutely. Yeah, you've got to. I mean, there's, we, we're, we're not here very long, you know? So my gosh, there's, and there's so many good things. There's so many, and there's so many bad things. So just crowd them out, you know, like mm-hmm. the ice cream. <laughs> if that's what you need, it's so important. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of joy, when this episode is coming out, so we'll be going into the holiday season mm. with Thanksgiving and Christmas and then getting ready to celebrate the new year, which is a very a joyous time for a lot of us, but it's also... A pretty tough time too. I mean, it's really taxing mentally for everyone, mm-hmm. let alone, I would imagine those who struggle with mental health, anxiety, depression, or just even on those recovery roads, it's got to be pretty tricky as well. Yeah, for sure. Holidays have always been, uh, I, I don't love this word, but have always been a trigger for me, um, you know, for just to trigger anxiety. They, they've always been hard. And the pressure to make them perfect and wonderful and joyful is a big part of that because it's a lot of pressure. You know, this has to be perfect and we have to make these memories. We have to eat the, just the right thing and be with just the right people and remember it forever. And it's, yeah, the presents, you know, like going to financial ruin over it for heaven's sake, just for that perfect gift. So that was always a really 
like I had some of my worst times around the holidays, absolutely, which which then made it worse because then it was like I had these memories. The memories I was making were were catastrophic. And so then it was even scarier going in. And not just for me, but for the people who love me too, because they knew, oh boy, here we go. We're getting closer. You know, how's she doing? How's she feeling? And one thing that another wonderful thing about my husband and family is that we set down a lot of those traditions and a lot of that pressure, which also I say what I need now. I, I say, you know, this is this is what I need. This is how I'm feeling. And this is what's going to keep me, keep me safe and, and make me feel that I'm going to stay safe. So we've made new traditions. My husband and I, we go to the beach on Christmas and we FaceTime with our, with our families. And occasionally we'll, we'll have some kind of gathering or get together with them. But almost every year we plan that for another time of year, like maybe later in January or something like that. And my parents are so wonderful. And um, my in-laws even, you know, also have said, we'll just celebrate when we celebrate, you know, we'll be together when we can, when we can be together. And I know Christmas especially was always a really big deal for my husband. So for him to just be like, no problem. Like we got to, this is our new tradition and this is wonderful and never made me feel bad about it for a second. It was a really, it was a really big deal and really a great gift. So for me saying this is too much pressure and I don't want to do it anymore was really important. And for my family to support that was amazing. But I also know that that's a privilege that I have that not everybody has. You know, a lot of families, a lot of people have kids, you know, I don't have children. So I'm able to just be like, we're just going to go to the beach. Like how privileged is that? Whereas if you, if you have a different kind of scenario with your family, if you have children, everything you're going to celebrate. But I still think that there is so much power in just asking for what you need and just telling the people that love you how to love you during that time. And, and to have that mind body connection, like to know there's so much in mental health that's very physical that our body will start to show us signals, even if we're trying to suppress with our mind, like what's going on when a storm is brewing. So to be able to pick up on those little cues and to realize that you're maybe headed down a not great path or headed towards a fall or even just headed towards feeling terrible and not sleeping for a couple nights, to be able to speak up and say, this is, this is what I need or this is what I'm going to try because I'm not sure what I need, but I'm going to try going to yoga class or I'm going to try to cancel all my plans for the weekend you gotta, you gotta do it. Like if you don't have, if I don't have my mental health, if I don't have sobriety, then I don't have anything. So yeah. gotta be first. Isn't it funny too, how putting those maybe boundaries in place for lack of a better word, or just simply asking for what we want or just expressing, Hey, I can't handle this right now. How tough just saying those simple words, because we oh, are, right. we've become such people pleasers. Um, and oh, yeah. mission to, making everyone else happy at the expense of ourself. I know I'm working on that. It's definitely, it's not something you get right every time yeah. for sure, but really trying to honor in and hone in and listen to yourself and verbalize that is so definitely. Important. And I think it's yeah. your experience is such a good showing of it of like normally the outcome, it's not that bad because then we create all these stories in our head of, oh my gosh, well, if I say that this is going to happen at this and this and this and this, and we just create this whole storybook that, in reality, normally doesn't pan out that way. Right. Yeah. We put a lot of anticipatory anxiety into something. And you know what? Even if it does, even if it does end with a fight or somebody's upset or disappointed or sad, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So if you're going to worry about it before, it's just going to mean you're going to experience it twice, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. but, but also it's better, better that, better, better to have, have that disappointed relative than for you to lose whatever safety health you've gained or that you need. You know, those are sometimes you have to weigh it out <laughs> and you got to choose yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I love how, what you just said there with, if you're going to worry about it, unfortunately, you're going to, if it's going to happen, you're going to worry about it. You're going to go through it twice. Mm -hmm. That is so true. Like so simple, <laughs> but so true because mm -hmm. It really is. It's almost like that right there gave me just such the sense of relief of, wow, why do I worry about things? Because you're right. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But like, don't put yourself through that torture twice. I know. Which, you know, and, and sometimes like if you're a person with anxiety, you can know that intellectually and still put yourself through that because you're, and it's not even you putting yourself through that. That's just chemically where you're at. But sometimes we do it. It's um, like in a way that we think we're protecting ourselves. You know, well, if I, if I experience all these scenarios, then when it actually happens, I'll pre be prepared for it. But it's, it's like, why? Because it's, 
then so I'm going to feel it now and I'm going to feel it then. Sometimes you just got to gotta just take a deep breath and, and give yourself permission to not, give yourself permission to not even prepare, to just be in the moment. Yeah. And sometimes you can't do that and that's okay too. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> 100%. Aside from kind of, you know, honoring yourself, asking for you what you want and things like that, if you, or, you know, just anyone, not you necessarily, but were to get into, you know, dealing with anxiety and depression and everything like that into a situation that you didn't really have control over or just kind of was something where you had to be there. Is there anything that you would maybe mentally say to yourself or kind of like set up to create that safety around yourself in those situations, if that makes sense? Yeah. Well, first, I would say we have a lot more control than we think when it comes to those kinds of things. Like there are a lot of times where we think we have no choice but to do the thing or to go to the thing or to have the conversation or something. And really we do. It, it's going to be hard to not do it. And somebody's going to be mad if you don't do it or sad, or maybe you'll miss an opportunity or something like that. But you don't have to do the thing. There's actually, this is a Glennon Doyle thing too that I love is that she talks about, oh my God, I'm so obsessed. She talks about how there's a story and actually I think she's told a few stories that basically are metaphors for the same thing, but about a woman who's in ironically a hot yoga class and she's so miserable and it's so hard and she feels like she's going to throw up and she's going to pass out. But you know, the teacher's saying like, you know, when it's hard, that's when the work starts and stay and da 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 da. And then afterwards she's like walking out just like feeling horrible, wishing she hadn't done it. And she, she walks out and she opens the door and she's like, the door wasn't even locked. Like, why did I do that? The door wasn't even locked, you know? And that's true so often, like in the job and in the, and of course there are big circumstances. And I, and I also know that I'm speaking from a place of extreme privilege when it's, when I say that, you know, I could, I can opt out of things that would hurt me. But so often we are sitting in a room and the door is open or we're sitting in a room and the door is locked, but the key is in our hand and we're just choosing not to open it and look at it and use it. So I would say the first thing I tell myself is that I have sweeping blanket permission to leave if there's a situation that I don't feel safe in for any reason. I always have permission to leave. I'm always allowed to just go. I mean, obviously if I'm on an airplane or something like that, that's going to be a different circumstance. But even then, I've got a place in my head that I can go. I've got some, I can blast some calming music and take deep breaths and just not have the conversation and just, you know, put myself somewhere else mentally. But I always just give myself permission to leave. I always give myself permission not to go. And if I do decide to go, I, it's my decision. You know, I'm there because I chose it. And I keep telling myself that, that, that like, this is a, this is a scenario that I put myself in because I had the power to, and I did it. And so I'm here of my own accord because it's really, once we get in that mindset where it's like, I don't have control of my life. I'm not steering this ship. Feel that out of control feeling, that's, that's a terrible feeling, you know, for anybody, but especially somebody that has anxiety or any kind of mental health um, challenges. So I definitely put myself in that place of this is my choice. And then of course, there's always like I said, you're on an airplane, you can't actually parachute out, unfortunately, but you've got, you've done the work, you know, you've done the work, you, you have, you have that dirty inside, you have that, that place you can go, you can close your eyes, you can take the breaths, you are a safe place. Yeah, mm, I love that, and it's so true, because the door is usually not locked. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, no. it's yeah. It's How is it for you? And now with where you are in your journey, do you, do you drink at all now? Does your husband drink? Are you comfortable around alcohol? I do not at all. And I don't want to. And to be able to say that is such a freaking gift. Like I can't oh, even tell you because it feels so good. Ah, so good. Cause there was a lot, like I said, I've, you know, there were a lot of years that I was, you know, sober, but really felt like I was missing out on something and new, sorry, my cat just popped into the screen here. He wants to hang out. <laughs> um, he, anyways, there were a lot of times that I felt, felt like something was missing or that I, that I, there was a punishment, you know, that it was like, I did this bad thing where I can't handle this thing. So now I have to not have fun ever again for the rest of my life. And the shift that's happened like over the years is just that I, that I've realized I'm not missing out on anything and I'm getting so much more. I'm part of such a bigger party to be able to experience life awake and, you know, go to my head down on the pillow at night, you know, being proud of myself for a good day and sleeping a real natural sleep and waking up in the morning ready for a whole new day. And to, to have that every night and every morning is just such a gift that I don't, I don't feel 
I don't feel like I'm missing anything at all. And I strayed away from your question because my cat distracted me. But I love what you said there too, because I haven't personally, like myself as an individual, dealt with addiction problems or anything like that. But I have pretty much given up alcohol since the beginning of this year, just by choice. It was kind of a thing that had always kind of been popping up into my mind for several years, but it was always the fear of, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with my friends? Are they going to like me? What am I going to do with my husband? Like, how am I going to live my life without alcohol and Mm -hmm. not having it? Like nothing has changed. And if anything, it's actually gotten better. And it's more enjoyable without it. Like I hold better conversations and I don't, I would get a lot of anxiety from it upon drinking. It would give me, I mean, it would just, I would spiral all different places. So, but it's really, really hard. And even now I still struggle of just thinking of future situations. If, you know, I'll have a drink on a special occasion, but then I'm like, but do I have to be happy? Like, why do I actually need to have one? Like what's so special about that occasion? So, but I see how that aspect of it in particular for you on your recovery road would just be so crucial because you don't want to lose or feel like you're then going to lose those relationships. And like, what do I do for fun now? Well, and like you were saying, you know, what am I going to, how you wonder how you're going to celebrate or how are you going to enjoy this occasion without it? And it's so funny, like without, without this beverage, like who cares, you know, without, right. It's it's amazing. I mean, it's a ritual, you know, Mm -hmm. in itself. So it's amazing how much we put, um, how much, pressure we put on on that in our in our holidays and our celebrations and things like that but and I you know and I don't try to say like I don't know what next year will bring you know maybe there will be a time that I feel like I'm missing out but I know in my absolute heart of hearts that my that my life is better I am better I I am worth making the choice over and over and over again to not to not even go down that road ever again I don't I don't don't need to I'm happier without it and that's the key there too, is that it's my choice. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, cause I choose not to, I have control over that part of my life. My, my husband drinks occasionally, you know, he's, he doesn't have any problem with it. So, if it, but he doesn't very often around me because kind of like people that quit smoking, um, they get really sensitive to that, to the smoke and mm-hmm. makes maybe feel a little queasy, at least people that I've known. It's similar, like it's just a bad memory, you know, and, and the smell and I'm really uncomfortable around drunk people. And I I don't know if that's like a little bit of a like a like a trauma response to to be uncomfortable around that or just because drunk people are annoying. <laughs> so for sure. <laughs> I don't want to be around them. So um yeah, you can tell right away and it's you know maybe a little funny or something in the moment, but for the most part, I just don't have any need or want to be around it. And, you know, I've, I'm, like I said, over and over again, I have wonderful people in my life who, shockingly enough, actually not at all, really don't care what beverage I'm drinking when we're, when we're together. And surprise, nobody cares. happy and healthy. I know. I know. Exactly. It's amazing how much we think everybody's paying attention to what the heck we're doing. And really nobody, nobody cares. Like Nobody we're all, cares. We're all just taking care of ourselves. <laughs> so funny being humans. Yeah. In your recovery process, do you have any mentors who are in recovery themselves or were there any like key, like inspirational figures for you during your process when you're kind of like in the depths of it? Yeah, I love that question. Yeah, I don't. So I, I've said this to you before, but I am not a person who goes to AA. I didn't do the 12 steps. Um, I just, that traditional paradigm was just not my path. You know, I'm glad it's there and I know it saved a bazillion people's lives. So what a wonderful thing. But for me, that just wasn't my path. And I started, I, podcasts were a big thing for me. Um, the podcast that I listened to a lot was the home podcast, like H O M E home. And that's, um, Holly Whitaker and Laura McGowan, who are two people who they don't do that podcast anymore, but it's still out there. And I would recommend it to anybody who's, who's even questioning their relationship with alcohol. But those are two figures that I both of their, they've had books come out lately and, you know, I continue to follow them and bought their books before they even were out. Uh, I love everything that they do. So those are big ones. Lennon Doyle as well. I just yeah. adore her. She's adore here. Her. Did yeah. you follow her pre Untamed? Had you read her other books? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I read her. I remember when she was still married and I remember when she, I think I, I think I started following her around the time her first book came out. Okay. um, Yeah, I just adore her. And then, you know, funny enough, so I'm from Rochester, New York, which is, um, you know, upstate uh, New York. And 
Abby Wambach, who is now Glennon Doyle's wife, is from my hometown. Like my my best friend went to high school with her. Oh so my it's that's why I know. So of course I never met her myself, but I'm like, we're basically best friends because your wife went to my hometown, you know. I naturally. Obviously we're just all meant to be. Even more connected. I mean, they live down in Naples, so we can take a road trip. <laughs> I mean, I know, exactly. It's you know, not why I came to Florida, but it feels feels very connected. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I think I read or saw yesterday Dax Shepard, I think so it was celebrating his 15 years mm-hmm. um, uh, of sobriety. Yeah. I don't remember. Did he struggle with alcohol or was he something else? I don't I remember. think for him it was drugs. Yeah, okay. I think for him it was drugs. And, you know, it's so this is like really uncomfortable to talk about. Like, like the stuff that I went through, like that original the story I told you, like I, it's not fun, you know, it's not a part of myself I want to relive or anything. But my path was paved with people sharing their stories and my bookshelf is full of recovery memoirs. The podcasts were huge. Blogs were huge. Um, when you're going through it, you feel incredibly alone and you feel like nobody's, I am the worst person in the world. Nobody's as bad as me. No one's experienced this before. Sure. If they could survive it, but I, I can't survive this. Like I am, I'm different. You know, I'm special in a horrible way. So to hear other people say that they have, you know, visited that same special spot in hell that you are living in and then have survived and, and, you know, that now they're happy is just, it's so important. It's, it's so incredibly valuable. So to be able to, to do that is, I mean, it's just amazing that you're, that you're allowing me to tell this story. So, yeah. so thank you for recognizing that. It's, it's and really that you're in deal. the place in your journey to be able to tell the story as well, because I know when healing and going through things, there is a very particular time and place too when mm-hmm. we're able to share and are at that point where we can share. And yeah. it's just so beautiful to open open your heart, open your story in that way for everyone because storytelling and like you, you know, the power of connection is just, it's unlike anything. And that's where when people want to kind of poo-poo this internet heavy society we live in, I really, yes, there are bad ways, incorrect, incorrect ways, not bad ways, just incorrect ways of utilizing mm-hmm. social media and the internet and letting yourself using those as a band-aid to cover up other things. However, there's so much beauty in the sense of connection and awareness and learning and understanding that you're not the only one out there going yeah. through what you're going through. Those tools, they're huge. I mean, it worked for you, obviously. Huge. So Yeah, huge. Yeah, just to be able to to, to feel not so alone is, it's amazing. It's medicine. Yeah. Oh, it absolutely is. I love it. What did, do you have any plans in the future of even doing your own memoir or any like side projects? I don't know. I mean, I would love to, I'm, I'm a writer. Like I've been a writer for my whole life and I always said I would write a book. So I feel like more and more, like you said that I'm at that stage where it's, where I feel safe to share. Um, which is because it's no longer who I am, you know, like it's an experience that I had and it's, it's a part, it's something that shaped who I am certainly. And, but, but I'm able to separate it enough from like who I am at my core to say, you know, I'm grateful for this thing that helped me become the person I am now, but it's never been who I am. So yeah, so I would, I think I would probably at some point love to, to write it out, but, but we'll see, you know, I, I figure it'll, it'll come to me when it's, when it's time. Right, right now, the way I'm able to share is to, you know, have conversations like this. Um, like I said, I'm doing some coaching. So I feel like just to, I'm not an addiction specialist or mental health counselor or anything like that, but just to have lived through things, you know, I, things like that make th- those experiences are just so valuable um, to, to help other people again, see that they're not alone. So I think too, for the particular individual, sometimes working with a coach or somebody who doesn't have isn't considered a specialist or has gone through all this higher education can actually be a little bit more comforting too, because it's like, you're not at like a place of judgment if that's something that you struggle with, because it's more just one-on-one of like, you've gone through this, you have your experiences, you can help me open up. And even just having a neutral source to talk to is yeah so powerful. For sure. Yeah. And just to say, you know, like, I'm not saying that I'm at the finish line, but I'm, I'm this many paces ahead. So I can tell you, most importantly, it's survivable, you know, like the path is safe and, and you can get to this point. So yeah, for sure. <laughs> Forever a finish line? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I kind of hope not. You know, I, I feel like every time I think 
it's, it's easy to get into that space where you think, you know, I'm going to, once I'm here, I'll be happy. Or once I get this, I'll be happy and da, 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 da. But even if, but if that was the case, then how, how boring, you know, like you're there and it's like, okay, well then what the heck am I, okay, I've got, I've got the beach house. I've got the bazillion dollars. I've got the, you know, perfect everything. I mean, what, what else it's, life is about that next challenge. And, you know, like just how much more can I get to know myself and how many more, lives can I touch or people can I can I help what can I do how can I be of service in this world and I mean there's there's never going to be an end to that as long as there's people around yeah and there's so much space too I think that's something mm-hmm. that we really get lost in and oh other people are doing what I'm doing how are there people that I can reach but there's so much space there's so many mm-hmm. people and it's really the possibility like, kind of yeah. Out, in my opinion. yeah absolutely oh my gosh and there's always you know, everybody's, we go through a different challenge every single day. So there's going to be somebody that I relate to today that I, or that, you know, that I wouldn't have yesterday, you know, so every single day we're, we're just growing and, and meeting each other more in different ways. So yeah. pretty cool. Oh, I know what I was going to say before is that another way that I'm sharing, I don't know, just the, the joy of recovery, I guess right now is that um, I'm working, I'm going to start actually a full-time virtual yoga teacher position with the Phoenix, which is that recovery group that I told you about that has free fitness activities for, for people in recovery. And it's just nice. It's a nice, like either alternative to um, the traditional, you know, AA type route or just on top of whatever, whatever path you've taken, you know, they embrace all, all paths. So I'm just to be able to do that on, on the virtual platform. So you know, getting far and wide is just another way that I'm so grateful I can, I can do it. And without raising my hand and saying, you know, I went through this, like this happened to me, like this is an experience I had and a path that I traveled. If I wasn't able to say that with really pride, then I wouldn't be able to do that. So yeah. what a gift. Such a gift. That's yeah. so beautiful. And just even to be able to connect so much more with the students on the mat to understand the place that he or she may be sitting at that point in time. And, oh gosh, just such an energy exchange. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Just that, that place of no judgment, you know, because we just, I mean, and I'm certainly not in a place of no judgment. I'm as judgy as the next person, you know, as much as I would love to not be, but (laughs) to have experienced some really low lows is, is putting you in a position, I think, to be able to really understand on the deepest level that we've all been through our shit, you know, like we're all going through our shit. Like there's just, you just don't know what somebody else, what somebody else's experience is. And all you can do is just hold space for them. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, Liz, thank you so much for sharing your story. Oh my That's, gosh, my pleasure. Oh my gosh. So empowering, so inspirational. If anyone wants to connect further with you or follow your journey, where can people find you? On Instagram is really where I'm trying to show up the most. Um, and I'm just at Starfish Yoga. So Starfish Yoga, all one word, nothing in between. Um, I have a website, starfishyoga.com. Hopefully by the time this comes out, I'll have that all updated and all the new things that I'm doing are going to be on there. That is my plan. This is going to be a good way to get my through me. <laughs> and I also have a Facebook group. I have a private group on Facebook that I, I teach just little pop-up classes, you know, 20, 30 minutes here and there, meditations and um, share little affirmations and things like that. And that's just the um, Starfish Yoga Inner Circle. So if you search that, you can ask to join and be part of the fun. So fun. I haven't been able to tune in live, but I've watched your bedtime yoga. Oh yeah. That you've done and have done them a handful of times. They're so nice. It really yeah. is such a nice way. I, it's always something that I've thought of doing before bed, but mm-hmm. didn't know quite the right movements. Or again, just that mental game was like, oh, I'm fine. I don't need that. I could just go right. to bed. I actually I'll just scroll through Instagram instead. <laughs> For sure. What like, can I Google to knock myself out? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, most of those bedtime um, stretches I do, you can do from your bed if you wanted to. You don't even have to roll on a mat. So. Yeah. yeah. So fun. I love it. Yeah. Well, before we close things out, I do like to end with some loving your own soul questions, which are just on the spot, kind of rapid fire, fun questions, just so our listeners can get to know you a little Yay. bit. Yay. Love. Cool. Well, are you a breakfast, lunch, snack, or dinner person? Oh my gosh. Am I allowed to say all of them? I literally love every single meal. I'm yeah. <laughs> food is just like one of the great joys of my life. <laughs> I love it. Do you have a particular type of food or cuisine or anything that's like your I mean it's for me it's really hard to pick just one, but it's hard to pick just one, but I would say just real basic things. Like I am um 
I'm vegan. So people often assume that I'm this really creative cook and really great with, you know, all sorts of fancy recipes and vegetables. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no simpler, the better. Like I'm like a soup and sandwich girl. Like those are, that's probably my simplest or pretzels and hummus, you know, something. Yes. Or sour patch kids, like we said. (laughs) Totally. I love even just like toast with avocado and spinach. Like super basic veggie sandwich is so good. Yeah, definitely. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Simple. Simple is good for sure. But yeah, oh, food is my favorite, my favorite thing to do. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> Astrology question. Do you know your sun, moon, and rising sign? I do. I am Sagittarius sun, Pisces moon, and um, we're in a Pisces moon right now. So it just makes me feel special. Fun. Yeah. Well, like an extra emotional time for you. <laughs> I know. I know. Exactly. I mean, I don't really need an excuse to be emotional, but yeah, it does feel like a uh, permission slip to be. <laughs> um, and I'm a Cancer rising. Oh, cool. I'm a Cancer Rising as well. No kidding. Oh, that's cool. That's the one I probably know the least about. So we'll talk and tell me more about myself. Yeah. Having that water element made sense to me because my other Mm -hmm. two are fire. And I was like, I'm just more emotional than that. Like something doesn't feel right. And then in understanding Mm -hmm. how your rising works. And I was like, ah, that makes a lot. Comes together. Yeah. I had the same feeling when I learned about my moon because Sagittarius, I was like, I guess. And then I heard I found out about the moon and like what that meant. I was like, oh yeah. Yeah, There's there I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite animal or spirit animal or even like an animal who's been popping up for you lately? Well, I'm a big animal person. As you can see, I've got um, Nigel over here and my dog is right there and the other cats. So it's the animals everywhere. I have been having a real bird moment mm-hmm. over the past few years. I don't know. I just, I've been thinking about getting like maybe a bird tattoo because they just, like you said, are just showing up. And every time I see one, I have this just expansive feeling. It's like a freedom kind of symbol. So definitely, definitely a bird. I love that. We had an eagle who was hanging out with us at our house. We were going through a very um, interesting time, challenging time. Again, just one of those life experiences. We got through it, learned a lot kind of thing. But this eagle was with us through that entire period. And it was really interesting. Um, would come down on our dock, would let us get actually like pretty decently close. And wow. it was really magical. It was definitely very. What do you think that meant? I think it was yeah. um, that like kind of that safety and just being there and that symbol of, hey, everything is going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Survive this, you know, you can get above this. And almost as well, just that symbol of don't stay, don't succumb to a level, like challenge yourself if there is a higher, higher level or higher level of consciousness to kind of like get yourself to. So that is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Animals are amazing. I love that birds. I think birds are really symbolic. Yeah. 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 Me too. I'm into it. I thought for a minute I was going to be a bird watcher, like even like bought a book and I was ready to, you know, go khaki. (laughs) But um, then I realized I'm like, I don't actually want to I don't really read this book. I think I just really like looking at them and taking pictures of them. So <laughs> totally. I love it. Um, is there anything right now that you're curious about or maybe that you've just been exploring that's new for you? So I know that you just did a segment about human design and I am so into human design right now. Oh my gosh. I love it so much. Like it feels so good. Like everything I learn about it feels so right and and aligned and anybody that I (laughs) I'm a projector which means I'm supposed to wait for an invitation to like share but I keep not waiting and just sharing it with people and every time I do they're rolling their eyes at me a little bit but they people really connect with it you know I haven't had anybody say like oh that doesn't make any sense I'm not like that at all people are really it's like a permission slip to be who you are you know Exactly. A human design is so, I would call it life changing, but it's really not. It's just greater confirmation of who you are, but like validating or something. Total validation. I'm obsessed with it myself as well. And it is such a complicated science as well. I mean, there is so much into it. I've gotten my mom into it recently. So she's now kind of, she's a projector as well. Um, It's actually, I have a lot, I'm a generator, but I have projectors hold very close relationships in my life, which is kind of cool. So that is cool. My husband's a generator, so oh, good cool. combo. Mm-hmm. Oh, you guys have a really good relationship then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That energy works really well together. That's so yeah, cool. That's so fun. <laughs> I know human design. I could, yeah. I went down a rabbit hole on YouTube. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I well, I have a friend who I met online, and turned out that she like lives 
in my hometown on a street I used to live on, like all these crazy synchronicities. But she is a human design coach that I'm actually working with now and like business coaching, but she also does human design readings. And that was my first, my first reading was through her. And I, it was like such, so eye opening, so incredible. It was like such a gift to to learn. But yeah, you look at a chart, so like confusing. You're like, what is this thing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so fun. Kind of human design esque in a way. But last question Mm -hmm. When did your exploration to diving deeper into your own soul first begin? And how has it evolved since then? It's hard to say because of all the ups and downs with with drinking and things like that, because I feel like it was always there. I think since I was a kid, I was always had a really deep imagination and really, um, you know, just very intuitive, but I, it was uncomfortable, you know, so I feel like I, I muted it for, for a really long time. I think the probably the past couple years has been when it's really blossomed, but I think lifelong, I think lifelong I've been... I, I, that connection's been there. It's just been like waiting for me and now it's really growing and truly blossoming. And mm-hmm, yeah. Exactly. And that's the most beautiful part too, is it's always there. Mm-hmm. Like even if we drift off, go off course, there's always that place to come back to. Oh, I know. That's such a, it's just to, to know that you're, you are a person that you can trust, that you can rely on. That's always there. No matter what, no matter what, no matter what. It's like the, like, that, that unconditional love, but to have that within yourself, you know, is always come back home to it is just what it's all about. That's what we're all trying to figure out. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Well, mm-hmm. you're doing an amazing job. I've mm-hmm. had so much fun just connecting with you and sharing your story. And I love the way you're just continuing to share your gifts and experiences with the world. It's truly inspirational as you're kind of paying it forward and going through everything. Mm. Such a powerful story, such a brave soul. Again, just being able to share space with Liz here was honestly just such a gift. Um, I feel so grateful for her and her friendship and us connecting and everything like that. As you can tell, she truly just comes from the lightest of places with just such a pure intention. So I look forward to continuing to follow her journey and I hope you all enjoyed her story as well. Her Instagram and website, they are linked down in the show notes along with her Facebook group. So definitely feel free to connect with her. Her yoga offerings are so wonderful and she really just has a great style about her teaching. So definitely check her out. And thank you all so much for tuning in here today. If you do feel called and you want to rate and review the podcast, I will send you a free gift in exchange. All you have to do is head over to Apple Podcasts, rate and review, and then take a screenshot of your rating and review and email it to me to lovingyourownsoul at gmail.com. And in exchange, I will send you a free gift. But thank you all so much. I hope you have a beautiful closure of October 2020. And we will see you again soon. Thank you.